Kiitos. Uh, although Finnish and Estonian are very closely related languages, I'm going to speak in English. Uh, it's funny, but uh, Estonians actually know Finnish much better than Finns know Estonian. The language, I mean, probably also the people, but, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm very uh, astonished uh, often by the language skills that, that you have, your skills in Finnish, I mean. Uh, thank you for being part of this conference. Uh, I'm working at the National Institute for Health and Welfare in Helsinki as a researcher in a unit called Alcohol and Drug Research. Uh, I'm not so much going to talk about Finland, at least not compared to what Anne did uh, about Scotland and, and Ireland. Uh, I'm going to move on a more general level. Uh, I hope that is okay for you. Uh, I also thought that probably this is a joke or meant to be a joke that Estonia, Estonians might know more about Finnish drinking than I do. At least everybody behaved very well yesterday uh, when I came over by the ferry. As we heard, uh, the impact of alcohol uh, use on the health of both the individual and uh, individual drinker and populations has been extensively studied in the research literature. Uh, still, several researchers have recently claimed that alcohol's harm to other people and society is a neglected perspective in that literature, except for some specific issues like uh, primarily drink, drink, drinking driving or drunk driving and alcohol-related violence. During the last few years, a specific alcohol's harm to others research, as it is sometimes called, has gained ground to the extent that some have proclaimed an ideological shift within the field of alcohol studies. Others prefer to call alcohol's harm to others a uh, neo-retro perspective. Uh, there is, I don't know whether this neo-retro is so very, is very much used as a concept, but if I say it in Finnish, you might know what I mean. Uus vanha. There is something new and something old, and they are mixed together in an interesting and complicated way. Whatever the truth, uh, ideological shift, or only a neo retro perspective, whatever the truth, especially leading alcohol researchers in Australia, New Zealand, and the United States, as well as the World Health Organization, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and volunt other voluntary organizations have become active in studying and discussing alcohol's harm to others. So, one critical question is really, what is new in all this? The damaging effects on spouse and family, close people and strangers, were indeed an essential part of the standard repertoire of the temperance movement 100 years ago. And that is precisely what the current discussion about family violence and drunk driving is all about. That is, other people than the drinker become victims. So what is new? First, the use of the expression alcohol's harm to others is a newcomer in the discussion. It was launched for a broader public and started taking root only some five years ago when the Australian study al already mentioned by Anne was published. It was called The Range and Magnitude of Alcohol's Harm to Others. 
One essential novelty of the harm to others perspective is that it broadens our view of what happens before the harms have developed, or at least before they have become serious. The probably most important message of this perspective is that alcohol-related harms are inherently interactional. This implies that different types of harm emerge and are results of interaction between human beings. And therefore, we have to improve our skills when it comes to identify and detect those social situations and social contexts, contexts where harmful drinking takes place. Such an international view, interactional, sorry, such an interactional view on alcohol-related harm helps us to observe how harm is spread into multiple sites in society. It points to the fact that a vast number of people and social institutions exist in the area influenced by harmful drinking. The most evident people who are affected are family members, close people and friends, people caring for, the, for their close relatives, and sometimes also completely unknown people. But the harm is also felt in workplaces and by those working there, such as taxi drivers, restaurant personnel, nurses, social workers, the police, security personnel, etc. And my point here is that the harm to other perspective raises our skills to trace harm and notice harm, to understand how it comes about in social interaction and how it spreads through social interaction. Still one novelty of the harm to others perspective, a very different one from the former, is that it seems to have a tremendous political potential. The awareness that alcohol-related harm is multiplicative, that it spreads all around the societal organism, has shaped the perspective into a powerful political tool for the public health lobby in the alcohol field and in the alcohol policy debate in general, and particularly in the struggle against the international alcohol industry. In this struggle, the promoters of public health have been jealous of the success story experienced within tobacco policies. As you know, most people have gradually accepted that smoking disturbs and harms those in the close environment of the smoker. Regarding drinking, for years the development has been the op opposite, at least in Finland and in many other countries. What I mean is that step by step we have got used to the idea that wine and beer and other drinks, uh, is, they are customary and often even an almost binding norm in a whole range of new so social situations. Uh, still in the 90s, for in instance, in Finland, on the political level, it was m m most unusual to draw parallels between harm caused by smokers to the un environment on the one hand, that was what, what was called passive smoking already at that time, and harm caused by alcohol users to the environment on the other. So essentially it was thought that passive drinking couldn't be discussed at the same seminar as uh, we now, uh, uh, with that which is now called alcohol's harm to others, or by some people, passive drinking. That was because the smoke was perceived to disturb non-smokers in a concrete and very direct and even visually obvious way, because you had the smoke. 
In fact, the causal relation between smoking and particularly lung cancer was proved to be very strong. And quite differently, the link between drinking and its negative consequences for those around the drinker was supposed to be much more vague, more complex, and much more indirect. Currently, 20 years later, I get the feeling that this contrast in thinking about smoking and drinking is getting weaker. Alcohol's harm to other people has become an accepted standpoint in alcohol policy discussions. Researchers have facilitated this development, but the most active part in politicizing the alcohol issue in this direction has to be sought among voluntary organizations and non-governmental organizations. Probably Eurocare, Eurocare should be mentioned here in particular. Nordic and Baltic organizations have also been very active. And uh, the wish here has basically been to follow in the footsteps, in the footsteps of the to tobacco policy. When the first alcohol strategy by the European Union was prepared in 2004, the public health lobby wanted to introduce a suitable slogan influenced by the emerging harm to other re reasoning. So they, nobody was at that point of time talking about harm to others. And two expressions in that preparatory process were suggested. The first one was passive drinking, actually, in 2004. And the second one was environmental alcohol damage. Both these, these terms were dropped, however, in the final strategy. And, uh, the final strategy was approved two years later in 2006, and that strategy is lacking an overall concept depicting the effect of alcohol on bystanders. In spite of this, passive drinking as a concept has at least to some extent taken root in the vocabulary of voluntary organizations, and to my understanding also in governmental documents in Norway. In the World Health Organization uh, strategy, the global strategy to reduce harmful use of alcohol launched in 2010, the harm to others perspective is mentioned. It's mentioned several times using the words, those exposed to the effects of harmful drinking by others. Or well, there are also other expressions like those affected by harmful drinking by others. So actually, there is no slogan, no short term for this. But uh, the, the idea is anyway expressed in that 2010 document. All in all, I believe that at best, the concept of harm to others and the discussion around it uh, is illuminating and helpful. But at worst, it may be simplifying and stigmatizing. I will provide two small examples of how to avoid simplifying and stigmatizing. Uh, first, uh, the harm to others perspective, I think, means different things in different places. Uh, let me explain this claim, although I have no empirical evidence for it, at this moment at least. I think the harm to others perspective means different things depending on the cultural position of drinking in a given country or a given reason, uh, region. Uh, and it's depending also on the cultural position of drink, drinking-related harm. 
how harm is perceived in different cultures, in different countries, in different regions. In countries and cultures influenced by values developed within uh, temperance movements, such as the United States or Norway or Sweden or Finland, I suppose, I suppose that the harm to others perspective repeats many of the beliefs that were created and cherished in those movements. Despite that, the harm to others perspective still seems to have an eye-opening power also in these countries. This is the neo-retro uh, idea that I presented in the beginning. So it's something old, but also something new. In Mediterranean countries, the discourse on alcohol-related harm is of much younger date. And in that context, focusing on those exposed to drinking may have an even bigger added value than in former temperance cultures. And thirdly, in many African and Southeast Asian uh, countries, a large part of the population has been and still actually are abstainers. But Western drinking habits have spread also to these countries uh, during, let's say, the last th two or three decades, in, uh, that is, in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. And to put it crudely, people in these countries may be inspired by the harm to others perspective in slightly the same way as it inspired the temperance movement in the US and the Nordic countries a century ago. Uh, in Western countries, the public health perspective gained ground uh, from the 60s and the 70s onwards. Accordingly, the view of how to approach alcoholics became more humanitarian. They were not to be punished. Problem drinkers should not be stigmatized and they should not be blamed for their drinking. Alcoholism was regarded either as a disease that could be cured at the best or as an expression of social disadvantages that could be repaired. And consequently, those who drank destructively were considered to be victims. Those were the victims. And the slogan was, don't blame the victim. The harm to others perspective has a tendency to put the problem drinker and those around him uh, or her against each other. So you have on the one side those who drink and the others on the other side those who are victimized, those who are the objects of the former's drinking. From this follows that an accusing finger is pointed at the drinker while all other people around him or her are innocent victims. I think everybody understands that reality is often much more complicated that, than that. When alcohol-related harms emerge, people involved may, of course, be innocent victims, but they may also be guilty or partly guilty. And this is also, I think, a challenge when we look at the harm to others perspective as a, something that unites people and is about the interaction between people. So it would be unfortunate if the neo-retro discovery of the negative eff effects of alcohol on the env environment would be used to stigmatize and punish people suffering from alcohol problems instead of helping and supporting them. And it would be fortunate if the harm to others perspective broadens and deepens our knowledge of the circumstances under which alcohol-related harm appears and spreads. 
That knowledge is needed when trying to reduce problems in our immediate surroundings and in society at large. In Finland, we published a book on harm to others two years ago in Finnish. There is, there is um, an English, an ex extensively English summary also uh, in the last part of the book. Uh, the book is edited by Katarina Varpenius and Maria, Maria Holmila and me. Uh, it's easy, available on the net if you are interested and if you want to use your excellent Finnish skills in Finnish. Uh, in this book, uh, you can see already from the title that we uh, divided the objects of uh, the harms into three. We talked about close people and other people. Actually, it should have been in Finnish also kansa uh, ihmiset, those who uh, are not really family members, but for instance, friends or people who we uh, meet in the street. And then as a third category, we had society, institutions, workplaces, uh, the service system, for instance. And uh, the book was, was actually divided into three sections. And uh, here are the, two, the first two of them. Uh, I will only show you what kind of, of, of people that we uh, covered in the book, in the different articles in the book. Uh, so, as we already discussed, uh, the uh, interaction between drinking parents and children is very uh, central in the book. And uh, also, the interaction between husband, uh, the drinking husband and the drinking wife is, is uh, uh, treated in the book. Uh, then there is an article about the problem drinking uh, elderly parent and his or her caring uh, child, which is probably something which is discussed also in other countries than Finland. Actually, we'd, we have many newspaper artic articles in Finland today uh, discussing how uh, people in their 60s or people who are, who are just retiring are taking care of their uh, parents who are in their 80s or even 90s and uh, who have a drinking problem. Often, very often it's not only about the drinking problem because uh, different kinds of medicaments are used in that age. So alcohol and medicaments uh, uh, taken together will actually be a polydrug problem. And that is something that really should be studied. It's not a very much studied area. Uh, then we have also an article about problem drinking strangers in public places where our results are very much the same as uh, Anne Hope already reported. And uh, what uh, strikes uh, the reader is that uh, really women are in a different position compared to men. Young women are the most uh, exposed uh, category when it comes to uh, being disturbed by people in, 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 in public places. Uh, the figures that we report from Finland are, I think, uh, in international comparison, very high. So that women between 15 and 29, that almost 70% of women between 15 and, and 29 uh, report that they have been afraid in public places because of intoxicated people 
during the last year. Uh, then we have an article uh, about uh, nighttime life, uh, about uh, people coming out from the restaurants and what, it, what happens when, when uh, at, at one o'clock, two o'clock, and three o'clock in the night. And uh, as you can guess, there is quite a lot of violence in those sites. Uh, and actually, somebody asked a question about what you can do what, uh, uh, on the basis of the knowledge that we get about these different areas within the discussion of harm to others. I think that just reducing uh, the possibilities of, of, of uh, uh, spending time to one or two or three or even four o'clock in the night would be one way of, of reducing violence, especially between men, but also between women and men and women. Uh, then there is a, uh, an article about drunk drivers and how they affect other road users. That's the tra traditional uh, subject within the harm to others discussion. Then when it comes to the third uh, category included in harm to others in this book, uh, society, uh, we have uh, several articles which are very, very different from each other, and I think that they might uh, open our eyes uh, to how uh, effectively alcohol-related harm uh, uh, spreads into different parts of society. Uh, One article asks whether there are any services for people uh, who take care uh, of their substance abusing relatives. Uh, that's kind of a new perspective and uh, actually there, there is very little offered to those people, although they are in a uh, difficult situation when helping their relatives. Uh, then one, one very uh, important thing is to, to discuss how much social workers and nurses experience uh, of problems when they, when they uh, from their drinking clients. We have, for the moment, a small project uh, uh, which is about uh, professionals. They are health workers or social workers who make visits to elder people's homes. Do you call them home carers or home carers? Yes. Kotihoitaja in Finnish. And uh, the question is, what do they encounter when they when they step into these homes. And uh, we now have some 12 uh, uh, interviews with the uh, home carers. And the stories are not very nice, I would say. So they, well, well, well the perspective here, if you think about harm to others or passive drinking, uh, is that uh, these home carers are not able to do the job that they are supposed to do just because their timetables are fussed up uh, and uh, and they should and they are not actually skilled they are not educated uh, uh, to take care of situations that they are that they run into uh, this is something that we are just to, trying to, uh, to put on the agenda in Finland. Uh, you could make a parallel which is not taken from the book at all, and uh, mm, the police. 
there is uh, some discussion in Finland about what the police actually has to do uh, when they meet uh, intoxicated people in the street. And there is a 45 years discussion in Finland who is responsible for these intoxicated people who have just uh, uh, fallen asleep in the, in the street or, or almost done it. And, uh, and uh, this, this almost 50 years uh, discussion has not led to <laughs> any result. You, you see, there, there are, there are di several professional groups involved or several that could be uh, responsible for this. The police, social workers, and health workers. And uh, still today, the most uh, common way of handling this situation is that the police takes care of, of these in intoxicated people and they drive them to a shelter, they take them into custody for one night or at most one day. But uh, what happens then? Then they are just set out in the street again. Uh, and uh, if you look at this from the harm to others perspective, I would say that again, like in the former example, uh, the interesting thing is whether the police is able to do what the police is supposed to do, because the police is not supposed to, to act as, as a uh, health worker or social worker, although there are, of course, traits, some features of, of those uh, professions, tasks also in, in the police work. But mainly it should be a problem for a task for, for social workers and health workers. Uh, then the third point there is about uh, uh, harm to others from a sickness absence uh, perspective. People are away from their jobs uh, due to alcohol consumption. And the next point is uh, quite similar. Uh, it's about disability pensions. And that's, uh, I think, a very complicated thing because, because you don't get information on the role of alcohol when, uh, when, when uh, putting or, or offering disability pensions to people. So alcohol, like in many other contexts, alcohol is kind of toned down it's a shame to, to, to talk about that. And uh, even uh, physicians try to avoid it. There are many explanations why physicians are not willing to talk about alcohol problems. I think one is that alcohol problems are very different, difficult to cure. It's a long process. It's a mixed process. And alcohol problems are so entangled with other problems, mental problems, and so on, that uh, uh, physicians are not kind of ready to go into that uh, probably very, very uh, long process. Uh, then the last point there, which is also covered in the book, is about the monetary costs. There were some questions about this. Uh, after Anne's lecture, uh, uh, I haven't put it on the slide, but uh, one interesting thing is that that the money that is used uh, when you try to cure people uh, from their alcohol problems couldn't be uh, could also be looked as an investment. There is one article looking on the costs, not as something bad, not as something negative as such. But the article is looking at the money put into treatment, for instance, treatment, 
as something as as an investment, and uh, it kind of turns uh, the perspective uh, 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 upside down. Uh, and I think it's worth really uh, thinking about this. Costs are not only bad things. Costs are also something that uh, that we should plan. Of course, we should use money in a clever way. Uh, but of course, it's also true that if we would have less alcohol problems, we would also gain from that situation, so that we could use that money for other things. To other things. Yes, I think that uh, I'll stop there and uh, take questions if there are any. Thank you. <laughs>